Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Parle Revival. After sailing 3,000 miles from Mexico to French Polynesia, we were having an absolute blast exploring the Marquesas Islands and letting it all hang out as we bounced from one island to another. But it was time to move on to the Tuamotu Islands, and what better way to do that than racing our friends on SV Dallas in a 450 mile open ocean race to see who will be the YouTube champion, a 46 and a half foot lagoon catamaran or a 53 foot Amal Monahal. So I'm Colin, and this is the crew of Parle Revive. From hurricane damaged, to broken bulkheads, and getting struck by lightning not once, but twice, to being the strongest and fastest Lagoon 450 on the planet. We are now sailing 5,000 miles from Mexico to New Zealand, my home, before continuing our circumnavigation. So subscribe to follow our journey around this beautiful planet. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did. So what are you waiting for? So the start of the race was to be Daniel's Bay, our final stop in Nukuhiva in the Marquesas Islands. The anchorage was absolutely stunning and the perfect farewell to what had been an amazing intro to French Polynesia. But our focus was soon turned on the task at hand, our first ever open ocean race against the pioneers of the YouTube sailing world. Okay, in just over an hour we're going to be leaving. We've got 450 nautical miles to go. It's a race against Dalos. They're gonna come over soon and we're gonna Talk about the terms of the race. You ready to do this? I was just talking about how this is like the, the tiebreaker. There was a lot on the line here. Monohull vs Catamaran, upwind for three days. It was going to be one hell of a challenge and neither Brian nor myself was going to take this lightly. We were a big old production catamaran but we had a crew of eight. Brian would basically be sailing solo as he has a young toddler on board but his boat was built for these conditions. It was going to be an interesting race, that's for sure. And it was decided that for every minute that one motored would be a minute penalty at the finish line, as the winds looked pretty unpredictable for the first day of the race. See you at the finish line when you're an hour late. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Remember, we're sailing with a toddler. <laughs> oh, the excuse is already. <laughs> it's on. It's on. I kind of feel bad for Brian and Kaz. It's just them two. It kind of sucks. And we're exhausted after a passage, we're eight people, so imagine that and a kid. Yeah, no, she's right. So, Kazza basically looks after Sierra the whole time. She'll do one watch of three hours, and that's when Brian has to look after Sierra. But other than that, she's got the toddler the whole time. But it's going to be tough because we're going to be close hauled for a lot of it. And as you guys, well, you may, may or may not know that a monohull points a lot better into the wind. Uh, catamarans generally, like especially production ones like this, aren't designed to sail into the wind that close. So they're just going to be charging straight through it and we're just going to be sort of slamming into it. A lot of bridge slams, so the waves come up and just shudder the whole boat. Um, so definitely not ideal for us. It's, uh, there's basically no downwind sailing at all. And these boats are basically designed to just sail downwind. So our strategy for this race, we're going to sail almost directly due south. And it's going to be almost, for us, we're going to be close hauled for the next day, two days basically. Um, and that is to set us up to be beam on when the winds hit 20 knots. So we do not want to be sailing into a 20 knot wind, but if it's on the beam we'll be going extremely fast. So that's why we have to sail directly south rather than going straight towards the atoll. Um, if we went straight towards the atoll, we would be screwing ourselves for the second half. It would be so uncomfortable. We'd have everything reefed, everything, everyone would be on edge, be slamming up and down. Um, so we're trying to avoid that at all costs. And put extra pressure on this, making it a race because we kind of want to win. <laughs> so it means we want to be going fast. Um, if it wasn't a race, we could put three reefs in and just cruise, but we've got, uh, we don't even have anything on the line. What's, what's, what's the prize? Just bragging rights. Yeah, you guys ready to get underway? 
Yep, we're just about to pick up the anchor. Right on, we'll see you out there. Did you get my uh, last message? Yeah, we're thinking maybe uh, loser host dinner. <laughs> Perfect, it's on. They know we're about to go. <laughs> that gave me a heart attack. The hairs on my arms are standing up straight. There's a lot of them. Okay, Delos is picking up their anchor. So are we. It is go time. And we were off. It was a shame that we couldn't have spent more time in the Marquesas Islands, but we only had received a three month visa on arrival in French Polynesia and had a whole lot more to see. We were super excited for the Tuamotu Islands, which a lot of cruisers have said is their favourite place to sail in the entire world. Alright, three, two, one. And just like that, we were off and we had absolutely beautiful conditions to start with. Although the weather forecast looked pretty rough, we had no idea just how gnarly it was going to get as our boats were pushed to their absolute limits. This is awesome. It's really evenly matched. They're sailing a little bit better than us right now. They got that huge genoa. I've got everything tuned the best that I can right now and they're pulling away from us slightly so looks like they're quicker upwind for sure. This is racing. How do we go faster? Katie, jump off. How much weight? <laughs> Blow the sails. So many people. Massive fish. Put it this way, he would not slow down for us if we had a fish right now. No way. I wonder how close I can get without hitting his line. That would be dirty. Let's cut his line. Oh, cut his line? <laughs> we think we lost that. We think we lost the tuna. Or whatever it was. So, unfortunately for them, the fish managed to spit out the lure and we were able to take the lead. There was no way I was going to slow down for a fish. There was too much on the line. After all the years of work we had put into Parlay, this was more than just a race. It was proof that Parlay could hold her own and keep up with even the best of the best out in the open ocean. But our beautiful lead was to be pretty short-lived as we sailed straight into a hole behind an island with no wind at all. We've literally lost all wind. We came a little bit too close to the island. And look at the sail. <laughs> And if we I thought this would be far enough away, Dallas are there and they've, they've seen yeah, us good. and they've headed straight out that way to stay in the wind and they're catching us. We're doing like two knots right now. So if I motor, if I motor for an hour, we'll get out there, but then we'll have to add an hour onto our time. I'm kicking myself. This, Absolute amateur hour. They're coming in this way now, yeah. I'm really surprised they just walked into this trap straight behind <laughs> us. The survey says let's motor, so... Try and both engines. <laughs> what would you guys do? Bob around at two knots? Or motor at eight knots? They're right here now. We had such a good lead on them. Four o'clock, motors are on. Yeah, probably the stalls. Yeah, just letting you know that our engines went on at four o'clock. Your engine, am I hearing this right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. We are going to be getting analyzed. But yeah, four o'clock. I'll tell you when they're off. Okay, that sounds good for us. He's putting up the kite. Putting oh, up the kite? Oh, yeah. The kite. There's not a lot of wind back here. I have like nine knots, eight knots. But we'll see. We were just in this little hole right there. Now we got 10 knots of wind again. So we 
to take a five minute penalty. Delos, Delos, Parlay. Yeah, Parlay is Delos. Okay, yeah, our engines are off. Uh, we'll take a five minute penalty. Okay, sweet. Yeah, and we just put the kite out. So they're going to go downwind. This is where we're going to split, I guess. They'll be heading in that direction and we're going to keep going beam on so that we're prepared for those high winds towards the end of the trip. As we thought, being a monohull and a bit more of a blue water boat, they might just plow straight into it. So we should see them sailing off into the distance down there. We're going to stay on this heading. We've got about 60 degrees to the wind. They're also doing two and a half knots right now, 2.9 knots. The wind is all over the place. Yeah. I still think we did the right thing. We motored for five minutes and found, got out of that hole. They're doing two and a half knots, so they'll be stuck in that for a little while. I feel like it was better just to get out of it. And now we're doing six and a half knots boat speed. Back on track. Dallas are doing 1.6 knots now. We're doing five and a half. To get out of this hole here, but I think we're just going to keep track of engine hours. I just took a picture of it so we'll know uh, what's up at the end. Did I hear that correctly? <laughs> You're motoring? No, <laughs> oh, we just got our wind back. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better than when your watch falls right at sunset. Check this out. So as the sun was setting over to the west, we started to well and truly be sailing offshore with nothing but ocean surrounding us. We couldn't even see Dallas anymore and we wouldn't be seeing land again for another three days. Conditions were absolutely perfect, but even in the middle of the night, I had to keep my game face on. Okay, so it's midnight and um, Dallas have gained on us. They're only slightly behind us. So I just came up and I tweaked the sails a little bit, went a little bit more, beam on. And uh, we're doing eight knots now, so hopefully they don't overtake us. But uh, it's getting a bit more, um, a bit more wind, a bit more seas. It's an absolutely incredible night. It looks like it's just come off a full moon. So it's um, super bright. Good morning, everybody. It is day two of the race. Parlay is in the lead. Sorry, Delos. And yeah, it's it's amazing out here. It, it really does look like we're back on the Pacific crossing. There is absolutely no land in sight. Just blue, beautiful, crisp waves all around us. <laughs> we're racing, so we ain't slowing down. In normal conditions, I'd consider dropping some sail and slowing the boat down so that we can reel the fish in. But there was no way I was going to do that in a race against Brian Troutman. 58. 58 centimetres. Inches. Inches. That's for sure I've ever caught. The biggest fish I've ever caught. And we haven't had any fish for since the crossing. So and that's why we kept this one. Yes, it is a big fish. But it's going to feed eight of us probably for at least one week. You guys know the drill. We're going to stop fishing now until we've finished eating that. It's going to feed the fun out for like a solid week. So, pretty sustainable way of fishing if you ask me. The rods are now staying on the boat. Dallas, 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 parlay, do you copy? Second time I've tried to get a hold of them today. Oh, holy, oh shit. Uh, wow! Oh my god, it's such a huge fish. <laughs> it's a big tuna. So it turns out we weren't the only ones having a good day of fishing as we continued to sail south through the Pacific Ocean. It was another day of what you'd call champagne sailing, with a beautiful beam on wind gliding us along at a lovely eight knots. But that was all to change as we headed into what would be an incredibly tough sail towards the finish line. It's been a really tough night. Um, we're beating into it, 50 degrees. So we're only doing about five and a half knots. I see Dallas on the AIS are doing like sevens, smashing straight into it. We're, we've got one reef in, because I know as soon as we pull that reef out, we speed up a little bit. We'll have to probably reef it again. So we're just sitting in that spot where we don't really want to have full main up and there's scores on the horizon. 
It's the classic downfall of a multi-hull versus mono-hull. We just can't smash into it as well as they can. So they're uh, doing like two knots faster than us. Every hour they're doing two miles more than us. So not ideal, guys. Not much else we can do, though. I have to put my pride aside and my competitiveness aside and just go for a bit of comfort over uh, just pushing the boat to the absolute max. up there. I, I'm honestly, I woke up from my watch and I'm not even really sure. I've just been like getting stuff, taking stuff down, taking the life jackets off the dogs, putting them back on. So the 20 knot winds that were forecasted had finally hit us and conditions deteriorated as we struggled to sail into the wind. To make things worse, we were surrounded by squalls. So the perfect conditions we had yesterday were long forgotten. I've never seen that much water come over the side of the boat before. <laughs> the floor just came up. <laughs> what the heck? Vicky, <laughs> did you know what you signed up for? Sure. I trust Colin. 100%. Yeah. I'm not worried. Uh, true wind has been up to about 33. Uh, it's been about an hour now. There's like a squall on one side, on both sides of us. But the wind was meant to pick up to about 20 knots, but I think it's a little bit higher than that at the moment. But I'm not sure if it's going to get any better. Yeah, I wonder how Colin's doing. Uh, Can't be that fun. Nope. But just squall after squall after squall. It was rough, huh? Oh my gosh, it was so rough. We were getting air in our cabin. This is your first ocean passage. It is. First my first time experience. sailing, so I'm getting the whole experience. She's <laughs> like, I'm never going sailing again. No I hate you, Colleen. Loving I thought you were my best friend. <laughs> it's better now though, right? Yeah, it's still not yeah. that good. It's still not comfortable. It's not bad, but it's not comfortable. Yeah. So Delos went, um, they cut the corner a little bit, and then once they got on this course they were 25 miles ahead of us but when we made our turn we were sailing really well and we're doing about eight knot average I'd say so we're slowly gaining on them now we're only 11 miles behind Delos so we might have a chance of catching up to them in it I don't know it could be a could be a bit of a photo finish so that's exciting um, but I just spoke to Brian he's got his um, in-mast furling stuck on the third reef did something weird with the furler last night during one of the squalls. You know, I don't know if I overloaded it, but it blew the breaker. Uh, but we're kind of stuck on our third reef. Uh, so we're gonna lose a little bit of speed there, but we only have 109 miles to go. So we continued to plow our way south towards the Tuamotu Islands, and we were about to do a watch changeover. When you hand over your watch from one person to the next, we always make sure that we give as much detail as possible about the previous watch so that the new watch keeper can get an idea of how conditions are changing. Katie and Kiki have been on watch. We're taking over. 113 miles to go. What, uh, what do we need to know? So for the first hour, we said that the average apparent wind was 20 and the average speed over ground was like 7.9. And then for the second hour, <laughs> we don't know if this makes sense, but it feels like the apparent wind dropped, but our, our speed over ground increased. So what the girls had experienced here was a wind shift, meaning that the wind had moved more on the side, and even though the wind speed had dropped, Pale was actually sailing faster. This was all extremely useful information for me as I took over the watch. So because it was so squally all day, we have had hardly any solar charge. Now the skies are starting to clear and it's about to be night. So I'm going to start the engine, but the way I start the engine without putting it into gear um, so that it just charges the batteries is I start it. So now that's the engine with our big alternator on it. should be putting about 180 amps on it. And it's got the wake speed regulator from Dragonfly that controls the amount of charge. The lithium batteries are going to try to suck as much um, charge out of the alternator as it possibly can. So you need a regulator to make sure you don't burn out the alternator. And then all I'm going to do is I press this button here and if I press that button and put it in forward or reverse, it increases the RPM but doesn't click it into gear. 
We don't actually want to go any f any faster. It's 20 something knots out here, but we need the charge. It's either that or run the generator. Because it's so rolly and shitty, I'm just gonna go for the easy option, which is the engine. So now we're not cheating, we're not motoring. We're just charging the battery. The other engine is off and it's in reverse so that the folding prop folds. So now we've got a net charge of 125 amps going into the batteries. That's after the autopilot and everything uses its power. We've still got 120 going into the lithium. So it was our third day at sea as we sailed into the night with conditions not improving at all for us. Fatigue was starting to set in, especially for Brian who was on deck all alone. See how the sail's not real happy, how it's flapping on the leech. What I need to do is ease the sheet, move the car forward so it'll put a better angle on the sheet and tighten up. 18th sail change of the day. We'll see how that goes. Every hour we've gained a mile on Delos. If we keep this up, it'll be like a photo finish. So, exciting stuff. The only time I ever push the boat like this, it's 20 knots out here and I got full sail up, is when we're racing. I'd normally not even consider doing this. Probably have two reefs in right now in a normal passage. But yeah, every now and then you gotta push the boat to its limits. And that's exactly what I did. We smashed into the waves for another 24 miles to the finish line with full sail up. I hadn't slept all night and was absolutely determined to catch Brian but we've crossed the finish line exactly one mile behind Delos, which at the time I thought was a solid win for them, having assumed that they had not motored at all. But you know what they say about assumptions. Yeah man, just gonna say uh, good race. We we're just about a mile behind you and couldn't quite get ya. <laughs> that was a hell of a race. It's amazing for us to sail 400 and, I think it was like 60 something miles in total and be this close at the end, truly fantastic. So congratulations. So the race was over, but we still had to navigate our way into the atoll and over to the other side to the anchorage. This was my first ever atoll entrance and so was nervous about entering a pass for the first time, which are notorious for high currents and shallow reefs on either side. We opted to follow Dallas in through the pass, as he not only has more experience, but also has a deeper keel than us, so technically, if he can get through, so can we. The pass is a cut in the atoll where all of the water enters and leaves as the tide floods in and out. We had managed to catch this pass close to a slack tide, so the current wasn't too bad, but once we had entered we were surrounded by hundreds of small but shallow coral reefs, nicknamed bommies, which have to be avoided at all costs for obvious reason. Although we were following Brian's track, we were still closely monitoring both our Navionics charts and also using Google Maps satellite view to show the bomby locations in real life. We also had crew on the bow looking out for any obstacles along the way as we motored our way through our first atoll experience. The thing working against us the most was that we were heading east and the sun was still very low on the horizon, so I was super nervous and so thankful that Brian was leading the way. We were making our way towards the other side of the atoll because that's where it would be most protected from the wind and waves and what we arrived to was even more spectacular than what we had imagined. Oh my god, we're in paradise, look at this place. The sun was low on the horizon, so it was really bad visibility, and when it wasn't sunny, it was super overcast. So, I'm gonna make sure we do the next pass a lot safer than that but you know that's a testament to that guy's experience level and his confidence and and he's just been doing this for so long he didn't even bat an eyelid and he's down in like a little cockpit area as well with the dodger and like he's still just i think kaza was up on the bow but unreal i feel like i got maybe from what i can imagine a full experience of what a crossing could be it was it was testing me at times. I mean, it got really intense. Like, that was probably the roughest passage I ever had on here, like, for sure. And of course, it's when Brady came, her first sail ever. <laughs> so, she, yeah, she didn't, she didn't understand, like, how, like, it was normal to hear banging on the hole and um, waves, like, crashing on the hole. Yeah. So, it must have been scary for her, and I can't imagine, like, I 
Go, go Brady, to be honest. <laughs> She's brave. Suspense was killing me, so I messaged Brian and just asked how many minutes he had motored. And he said they'd motored for 35 minutes. And we motored for five minutes. So I think that makes... We won. <laughs> Woo! Woo! We won? We just beat Dallas, a 53-foot monohull with one of the most experienced sailors I know in an upwind 450 mile race. That is a huge accomplishment. Okay, we got uh, Brian and Kaza here and Sierra. Hi. Yeah. Say hi to YouTube. Hi. We're just going over the... We're doing the, the uh, Yeah, we're just going over the race. I shouldn't have pushed the boat that hard, but how often are we going to get to race Delos? Like, this was something that I'm like, I want to give this everything we can right now. So you, we're going slightly. So we get, we get line honors, but you get uh, overall honors on correct attack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was just it was just so fun to to even come that close to you. Yeah, it was really you know. good. Good race, guys. Yeah, man. <laughs> and in true sportsmanship fashion, Brian and Kaza honored their word of cooking our entire crew dinner out of the massive tuna that they had caught along the way. As you can tell, I was ecstatic to have even just kept up with Dallas, whom I had watched on my screen years before Parley was even a thought in my mind. But more importantly, it showed just how seaworthy Parley actually is. And it's small victories like this which silence all of the armchair critics out there saying a hurricane damaged boat can't take to the open seas. Those of you taking on boat projects of your own, don't listen to the haters, just follow your heart and your intuition and anything is possible. See you next Sunday, guys.